Exodus chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 1 to verse 2. Exodus chapter 5, verse 1 and verse 2. And I'm reading from the King James Version of the Bible. And afterward Moses and Aaron went and told Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord, that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. I want to use our subject for our lesson this afternoon. The question that Pharaoh put to Moses, who is the Lord? When Moses was sent by God to declare unto Pharaoh his intention to deliver his people, Moses obeyed God but we also read that God hardened the heart of Pharaoh in a way that he did not have the capacity to respond accordingly. So it was more or less that Moses' work was a little harder because God made it so, not for Moses' sake, but in order to bring Pharaoh to judgment. Pharaoh had heard the cry of the children of Israel and paid no attention. He knew right from wrong. And there was a few other things that set up Pharaoh in this condition. If we take the background of the land of Egypt in the time of this particular Pharaoh, we see that Egypt was populated by many gods and goddesses. The gods and goddesses of ancient Egypt were an integral part of the people's everyday lives. It is not surprising that there were about 2,000 or more gods in the Egyptian pantheon. So when Moses went to Pharaoh and mentioned that the Lord said, let my people go, Pharaoh's answer was much more in terms of expressing his belief than a simple resistance. You see, even though Egypt had up to 2,000 plus gods, the head of all of these gods was Pharaoh himself. If I can put it this way, Pharaoh was the administrator of the gods of Egypt. And so if there was anyone that was going to be referred to as Lord, his mind would scan through his thousands of gods that are subject to him, and then he himself as the head god, which means that when Pharaoh asked the question, it was more or less like saying, who else could be Lord except me and my other gods that are also subject to me administratively? He did not let Israel go. He did not free them. If you read from Exodus chapter 7, 14, all the way to chapter 12, verse 38, it will place it in context, what God had to do in Egypt. The question was, who is the Lord? God had a way of answering this question to Pharaoh. The miracles and the plagues that came, the water was turned to blood. It was not just an outward show of God's power. God was picking out the gods of Egypt one by one to humiliate them. Egypt had a god that was named Hapi, H-A-P-I. That was the Egyptian god of the Nile. They had another god named Kum, 
was a guardian of the river source and they had a series the Nile was supposed to be his bloodstream the three deities could not protect the Nile so when water was turned to blood God humiliated at least three false gods of Egypt plague number two when the plague of the frogs came out in Egypt God was not trying to show Egypt that he can populate the land with frogs of inconvenience. He was also dealing with other false gods in Egypt. I mean, the one that is happy that was supposed to be the Egyptian god of the Nile had also responsibility as the frog goddess of Egypt was responsible also for water renewal and then of course there was a god named Heket and had the image of the head of a frog this was the one that was ahead of them that was in the category of making sure that frogs would not be used in an adverse way against Egypt but God humiliated them and brought the frogs out to show that false gods are powerless. Plague number three. It was the plague of the lice and the gnats. Was not just God trying to show off. He dealt again with the God, another god of Egypt, whose name was Gape. This was an Egyptian god of the earth was in charge of the dust of the earth he could have prevented the dust from becoming lice and gnats but in the face of jehovah god he was also powerless and humiliated the next was the plague of the flies egypt had urat the fly god of egypt also had Capri, who was shaped like the head of a fly. This was supposed to be the Egyptian god of creation, movement, and also rebirth. A combination of these gods that were supposed to protect Egypt, it did not work. God brought the plague of flies and registered his insistence for the deliverance of his people. The next plague was the plague of the livestock. Egypt also had a god that was the Egyptian goddess of love and protection, Hathor. They also had Ta and Davis and Ammon. These were associated with bulls and goats. Again, God brought a plague upon the livestock. They could do nothing because false gods are powerless. The next was the plague of boils. Egypt also had gods like Isis, the Egyptian goddess of medicine and peace, had Sednet, the goddess of epidemics, and had Imtop, the god of healing. When God brought forth the boils, they too could do nothing. Because in the sight of our God, false gods are powerless. The next was the plague of the hail, the storm. In that regard, Egypt also had gods. They had Nut, the Egyptian goddess of the sky. And they had set the agriculture deity. And they had Shu, the god of the atmosphere. Once again, he could, they could do nothing. These are false gods. This was followed by the plague of the Lucas. Egypt had the god that was supposed to protect the people from Lucas. The name was Serapia. Had another god that was supposed to be the Egyptian god of storms and disorder. They could not stand before the Lord. They too were humiliated. There was a plague of darkness in the land that followed. 
And this was a direct blow to the sun god of Egypt named Ra. And Amon Re, and Aten, and Aton, and Horus. They were supposed to reliably protect Egypt with the assistance of Tooth, the moon god. And our god humiliated them as well. What took place in Egypt was not just a battle between God and Pharaoh, but a demonstration of who is the Lord. And then came, of course, the final plague, the final hand of God upon Egypt that caused Pharaoh to let them go. And that was the death of all the firstborn in Egypt. In one night, the firstborn of Pharaoh, the firstborn of every family, and the firstborn of all the animals. And that is very critical because importance is placed in the firstborn for transgenerational purposes. The firstborn would become the king. The firstborn in the spirit is critical because even our Lord Jesus Christ is referred to as the firstborn for each and every believer. In humiliating the gods of Egypt, God proved time and time again that he is the true God. And he showed forth that there is no other God except him. It would seem like the message has been registered clearly for Pharaoh to know the answer to the question that he asked, who is the Lord? But after that, the children of Israel had departed. Pharaoh took his army and gave chase after them. He boxed them in by the Red Sea. And on, this, on one side was the desert. On the other side was the barren land and rocks and mountains. In front was the Red Sea, and behind was Pharaoh's army. Maybe he forgot the answer, so he is posing again by his actions, who is the Lord? When the children of Israel crossed the Red Sea, and Pharaoh's army attempted to cross after it had been divided, the Bible says the water came back again and drowned the armies of Pharaoh, once again proving what the answer is to that question, who is the Lord? Generations to come would be mistaken with that same question. In the book of Daniel chapter 3 from verse 24 to verse 25, we see that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up an image he wants the people to bow and to worship that image. And there is three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They refuse to worship the image. They were sentenced to be thrown in the fiery furnace, which was made hotter than it normally is. We read from Daniel chapter 3, verse 24, Then Nebuchadnezzar the king, was astonished. Something has happened. He rose up in a haste and spake and said to his counselors, did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, true, O king. He answered and said, lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Question answered again, who is the Lord? We could not even go much further than to see also in Daniel chapter 6 with the experience of King Darius due to the jealousy of the other princes against Daniel who had the fear of God and called upon the Lord continually. They set him up and they made the king sign a decree 
that nobody should pray to any other god except to King Darius. The Bible says Daniel did not change his prayer habit. He prayed to God as he normally did and not to man. So the, the snipers, the gossipers, they came and reported to the king and Daniel was sentenced to be placed in the lion's den expecting that he would be devoured but Daniel was not praying to Darius Daniel was praying to the true God and he locked the mouth of the lions and they did him no harm the question again is answered that question is who is the Lord they wanted to test and see maybe the lions were not hungry maybe they were toothless maybe they felt like eating nothing so they conducted a test they threw in others into the lion's den the scripture says they were eaten even their bones could fall to the floor of the den they were devoured by the lions which proves again who the Lord is we come to the book of first Kings in first Kings chapter 18 we see the prophet Elijah on Mount Carmel because there are 450 prophets of Baal and there are also 400 prophets of Asherah this way engineered by of course Jezebel who brought in intense idolatry into the land and there was a contest on Mount Carmel with the same question who is the Lord the Bible declares that when the test was made there was a declaration that only the God that answers by fire can be the true God and indeed he did exactly that when the false prophets call upon their God and Elijah would mock them say cry out louder maybe he can't hear you shout some more maybe he is sleeping continue he might be on vacation and he's not back yet it was in the evening that the prophet Elijah said I think you've cried enough it's obvious you don't have the Lord give me an opportunity he wet the altar till the water fell into the trenches and he called upon the true God and he answered to prove himself he not only took up the sacrifice he dried up the water in the trenches once again emphasizing the answer to the question who is the Lord in the book of Numbers chapter 16 and verse 12 we see Korah and his companions rise against Moses who was ordained by God to lead the people they thought that because they are also children of promise that they are also leaders automatically they rejected the leader they stood against him they incited rebellion because they believe that Moses was just taking too much to himself and had no right but Moses' rights came from the Lord and in number 16 and verse 12 we see how the land opened its mouth and swallowed Korah swallowed his family swallowed his possessions swallowed everyone that was standing on his side once again affirming a clear answer to the question who is the Lord it seemed like generations after generations seem not to take the answer that has been so clear each one took a turn to tempt God as if to want to know who he is who the true Lord is it takes us to the prophet Elijah again in the book of first Kings and in first Kings God demonstrated his power 
He said in verse 11, 1 Kings 19, and he said, God saying to Elijah, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by and a few things happened and a great earthquake and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice that instructed Elijah, that was the voice of the Lord. Takes us also to the experience of the Apostle Paul. And I'll read it from the book of Acts chapter 17 from verse 22. Paul the Apostle is going through Athens. There is something that concerns him. And he is standing on Mars Hill the position of the earthly powers and authority. He said, Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. And this is what he says. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things and had made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and had determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation verse 27 that they should seek the lord if happily they might feel after him and find him though he be not far from every one of us. Paul is telling them that God is personal. God is near. God is not a religion. God is a tangible God. God is a spirit. They should not try to worship him different from who he is. Paul had noticed that they were worshiping without knowing God. There is abundance of evidence that God has been in the business of answering this question over and over and over again. But for us who have the complete scripture, the question sometimes arises, who is the Lord? Let's run down a little bit who he is. In the book of Genesis, he is a creator and the promised redeemer. In the book of Exodus, he is a Passover lamb. In the book of Leviticus, he is a high priest. In the book of Numbers, he is water in the desert. In the book of Deuteronomy, he becomes a curse for us. In the book of Joshua, he is a commander of the army of the Lord. In the book of Georges, he delivers us from injustice. In the book of Ruth, he is our kinsman redeemer. In 1 Samuel, he is the prophet, the priest, and the king. In 2 Samuel, he is a king of grace and love. In 1 Kings, he is the ruler greater than Solomon. In 2 Kings, he is the powerful prophet. In the book of 1 Chronicles, he is the son of David that is coming to rule. 
In Second Chronicles, he is a king who reigns forever. In the book of Ezra, he is a priest proclaiming freedom. In the book of Nehemiah, he is the one who restores what has been broken down. In the book of Esther, he is a protector of his people. And in Job, he is a mediator between God and man. In the book of Psalms, he is our song in the morning and at night. In the book of Proverbs, he is our wisdom. In Ecclesiastes, he is our morning, meaning for life. In Songs of Solomon, he is the author of faithful love. And in the book of Isaiah, he is a suffering servant. In Jeremiah, he is a weeping Messiah. In the book of Lamentations, he summons God's wrath for against the people on behalf of us and in the book of Ezekiel he is a son of man in Daniel he is a stranger in the fire with us in the book of Hosea he is a faithful husband even when we run away in Joel he is sending his spirit to his people in the book of Amos he delivers he justifies to the utmost and in Obadiah he is is a judge whose presence with us remains unquestionable and in Jonah he is the greatest missionary in the book of Micah he is a God he is a God who exists forevermore and he is the one who will never forget us in the book of Nahum he is the one who proclaims the future for world peace and he is the one who cannot even be esteemed in the rate that we look at other human beings or people in the book of Habakkuk he crushes injustice in Zephaniah he is the warrior who saves in the book of Haggai he is the one who restores our worship in Zechariah he is the prophecies and he is the Messiah who is injured for us in Malachi he is the son of righteousness who brings us healings and arises with healings on his wing in Matthew he is is the Messiah who is also king. In Mark, he is the Messiah who is a servant. In Luke, he is the Messiah who is a deliverer. In John, he is the Messiah who is God in the flesh. In the book of Acts, he is the spirit who dwells within his people. In the book of Romans, he is the righteousness of God. In 1 Corinthians, he is the power and love of God. In 2 Corinthians, he is the payment of what we have done in the book of Galatians he is our very life in Ephesians he is the unity of our of our church in Philippians he is the joy of our lives in the book of Colossians he holds the supreme position in all things in first Thessalonians he is our comfort in the last days in second Thessalonians he is our returning king in the book of first Timothy he is the savior of the world for sinners in second Timothy he is the leader of leaders in the book of he is the foundation of truth in the book of Philemon he is our mediator in Hebrews he is our high priest in the book of James he is the one that makes us mature in our faith in first Peter he is our hope in times of suffering in second Peter he is the one who guards us from false teaching in first John he is the source of all fellowship in second John he is God in the flesh in third John he is the source of all truth in the book of Jude he is the one who protects us from our stumbling and then in Revelation he is the king of kings he is the Lord of Lords he is the Alpha and the Omega he is the beginning and the end he is the one that is coming again. He is the one whose voice comes like thunder. And he is the Lord, our God. And everyone ought to know who is the Lord. His name is Jesus Christ. His name is Jesus Christ. It should leave no question. Except maybe 
a small lingering question before we close. The people who wanted to know who is the Lord. Some of them asked because they didn't know. Some ask because they have rejected the true answer. But I think I should ask you this morning, do you know the Lord? Do you know the Lord? Is there sufficient evidence in your life that you know the Lord? How can you know the Lord? John chapter 1 verse 12 says these words, but as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. In Romans chapter 10 from verse 8, we are given guidance on how we can know him and become one of his children. It reads, But what said it? The word is in thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in thine heart that God had raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. When you are saved, you will know the Lord. And one of the signs that you know the Lord is because you have an intense desire that others should know him too. When you look at those who do not know him, you don't mock them, you don't laugh at them, you lead them gently to the Lord. You become a light, you become the salt. You also want them to come and taste and see that the Lord is good. It is in our position today to look back at the question that Pharaoh asked Moses, who is the Lord? Do you know who he is? Do people who know you know that you know the Lord? Have you tried to hide yourself when you get around those who do not know the Lord? When you know the Lord, you see the light. When you know the Lord, you have wisdom. When you know the Lord, you worship him. When you know the Lord, you reverence him. When you know the Lord, you bow to him. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Do you know the Lord? Or are you asking who is the Lord? Have you answered that question convincingly? Thousands and thousands of people have answered that question. They have had to walk away from false gods in order to embrace the Lord. They have had to suffer in their families because they embrace the Lord. They disappointed witch doctors and wizards. They disappointed the wicked workers, diviners, They've walked away from divinations, incantations, libations. They've walked away from the gods, the false gods of their family because they know the Lord. Once you know the Lord, nothing can compare. And in order to know the Lord, the Lord must know you first. Because we are lost until he finds us. In the land of Egypt, as we close, God had appointed his people. They were being victimized. Hence, when God said, let my people go, Pharaoh would ask, who is the Lord? On the final day of their departure from Egypt, they killed the Passover lamb. God said they should kill a lamb for each family. 
and he said for those who are small and there's another small family they should come together and kill a lamb and for those who could not have the lamb which would be a sheep a goat was acceptable why is that because a lamb would be sacrificed as john the baptist said behold the lamb of god that taketh away the sin of the world and yet why the goat the goat was a symbol of a sin bearer that carried the sin typified in the ordinances of the old testament as the scapegoat would be driven out into the wilderness who is the lord when they slaughtered the lamb that night they were to do a few things they were to take the blood of the lamb and mark it on the two side posts of the door they were to also mark it on the top post of the door but notice they were not to mark it at the bottom post of the door because no one should trample on the blood of the lamb and the lamb would be jesus who would come and die on the cross that the lord will die for sinners is somewhat upside down in the thinking of today but that's exactly what our lord did he died for us and he told them that day, even though they didn't fully understand, when the angel of death comes to pass over the land, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. There is power in the blood of Jesus. There is power in the blood of Jesus. There is power in the blood of Jesus. Blood of Jesus. Yes, this is the blood of our redemption. This is the blood of access. This is the blood of the covenant. This is the blood of the New Testament. This is the blood of restoration. This is the blood of reconciliation. This is the blood of holiness. This is the blood of bringing us back into unity with God. This is the blood of victory. This is the blood that gives us the faith that we overcome the enemy and all the works thereof. There is power in the blood of Jesus. And that same blood is the blood of the lamb is the blood of the son of God and therefore we know now the answer to the question who is the Lord you must know that answer personally you must not only know who is the Lord your answer must also include who is your Lord if your Lord is Jesus no matter what you see in your life, he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He is there all the time. Some people are heartbroken because they have put their trust and dependency wholeheartedly on those who they didn't expect would let them down, will disappoint them. And there should be no reason why they should except they are human beings. Every human being is capable of disappointment. But our Lord will never disappoint you. He will never let you down. You may not understand all the time what God is doing in your life. But this one thing you will always know. The thoughts that he thinks towards you are thoughts for good. To bring an expected end. Maybe you live in places you associate with people that may not fully understand you. The mistakes that you make becomes a judgment of who you are in totality. But I call your attention before we pray to the fact that when the angel of death passed over the land of Egypt on the night that the firstborns were killed, when he saw the blood, God said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. He didn't see their perfection. He didn't see their righteousness. He didn't see their good works. He didn't see their good doings. He didn't see their character. They were not qualified. The blood protected them. We are not beneficiaries of our Lord because of us. 
but it is all because of him. I pray that today, when you answer that personal question in your spirit, who is the Lord, you will also make sure that you let others know who he is.